Okay, here we go. I hope you're ready for this. I hope I'm ready for this. Uh, I once spoke to my supervisor in religious studies about Ibn Arabi and that I was having some trouble understanding his ideas. And he comforted me by saying that anyone who claims to understand Ibn Arabi is either wrong or they're lying to you. So clearly we are here dealing with a very difficult figure, perhaps one of the most difficult thinkers in all of Islamic history, if not history generally. But since this is one of my main fields of interest and study, I will try to give you a sort of short, simple introduction to this massive figure in uh, Muslim history. So let's talk about Ibn Arabi. Abu Abdullah Muhammad ibn Ali ibn Muhammad ibn Arabi al-Hatimi al-Tai, or more commonly known simply as ibn Arabi, was a Sufi mystic poet and philosopher in the broad sense of that term that has had a massive impact on the Islamic intellectual tradition. To some, he is a very divisive and controversial figure. To those who admire him and follow him, is known as Sheikh Al-Akbar, or the greatest master, and sort of viewed as one of the greatest saints in all of Islamic history. And to others, he's a dangerous heretic. As will become clear, both of these positions stem from his very unique, fascinating, and complicated metaphysical and cosmological ideas, the basis of which is often called Wadat al-Wujud, which means the unity of being, and this is a doctrine that we will return to soon. But these ideas have cemented him as one of the most important and interesting thinkers and figures in all of history. Ibn Arabi was born in the year 1165 in the city Murcia in what is today Spain. What we call Spain and Portugal today was known back then as El Andalus and was, in the 12th century, a vibrant time of intellectual and mystical activity. Ibn Arabi was born into a rather wealthy aristocratic family, his father actually working for the local sultan in the city. And also, among other things, being close friends with the very famous philosopher Ibn Rushd, or Averroes, who Ibn Arabi would later have a very famous encounter with. For the most part, however, Ibn Arabi grew up in the city Sevilla, since his family moved there when he was very young. He would be educated, as was fitting for someone of his status, and he would take part in the vibrant cultural life of the city at the time. Al-Andalus was at the time ruled by the Al-Muhad dynasty, which can be seen as a rather puritanical and strict interpretation in terms of its social and religious policies. But in spite of this, the region was ripe with intellectual activity of all sorts. During Ibn Arabi's youth and in the time before, Al-Andalus and North Africa had been blessed with many famous thinkers and philosophers like Ibn Rushd that I mentioned, Ibn Tufail, Ibn Baja, the Jewish philosopher Maimonides, and Sufis like Abu Madian and Ibn Barajan, who were both predecessors of Ibn Arabi, who would greatly influence him. In fact, in his youth, Ibn Arabi would most likely have been exposed and influenced by many of these currents, even if he didn't receive any extensive education in philosophy or falsafa, the falsafa tradition, for example. Nonetheless, he lived a life for the first part of his life that could be described as rather worldly, uh, as, which would have been rather common for someone of his status at the time, but sometime in his teenage years he would have an experience that changed his life forever. It is said that Ibn Arabi was at a dinner party at which wine was being served, and just as Ibn Arabi was raising his glass to drink from it, he heard a voice that said to him, Muhammad, which was his first name, it was not for this that you were created. And this led Ibn Arabi to have a crisis in which he fled from the party and went to the graveyard in Sevilla where he meditated, some say for several days or even weeks. It was during this time of meditation that he had his first major spiritual vision and received what he calls fat or illumination or opening in which all the sciences and secrets he would later convey in his teachings were revealed to him all at the same time. 
At around the same time, he also claims that he had a vision of the prophets Moses, Jesus, and Muhammad, who all encouraged him to follow the religious or spiritual path. Indeed, Jesus was especially important to Ibn Arabi in this regard, and he refers to Jesus as his first teacher and the one who inspired him to his later asceticism. These visions and experiences would lead Ibn Arabi to give away all of his belongings and dedicate himself to an ascetic life on the Sufi path. Now, even though he considered himself to be kind of above most Sufi masters, since he had already received all the secrets and all the knowledge in this one first grand vision, he would still dedicate himself and study under uh, various uh, masters and sheikhs in Al-Andalus. Claude Adas, in his excellent biography of the sheikh called Quest for the Red Sulphur, writes, quote, In a sense, Ibn Arabi arrived at the goal of spiritual realization straight away. Following the example of the Majdub, the ecstatics, he burned all the stages and in one single leap completed the journey of the quest. But that he was, quote, obliged to make the journey again, step by step, to perform the wayfaring or suluk patiently and enter truly on the way. The masters or sheikhs he would frequent include, perhaps above all, a, quote, illiterate peasant called Abu Labas al-Uryabi, uh, but also names like Abu Imran, Musa ibn Imran al-Mirtula, and actually a few women like Shams of Marchena and Fatima bint ibn al-Muthanna. He talks about these masters in his book Ruh al-Quds fi Munashahat al-Nafs, released in English as the Sufis of Andalusia, and the Futuhat al-Makiyah, and in which he says, quote, I served as a disciple, one of the lovers of God, a lady of Seville called Fatima bint ibn al-Muthanna of Cordoba. I served her for several years, she being over 95 years of age. She used to play on the tambourine and show great pleasure in it. She used to say to me, I am your spiritual mother and the light of your earthly mother. Ibn Abi was also especially fond of the North African Sufi Abu Madian, whom he considered to be his almost foremost teacher and the Sufi that he mentions the most in his own writings, even though the two never actually met in person. He even claimed to be taught by Khizr, the legendary figure of the Quran that is said to have been also a teacher of Moses. Scholars tend to divide Ibn Arabi's life into two periods, the first part of which he spent in, uh, in Al-Andalus and the Maghrib in North Africa, and the second part in which he spent in the East. Uh, indeed, for the first part of his life, he never left his home region, and he would travel across modern Spain, Morocco, Algeria, and so on, visiting different masters, traveling between cities, visiting masters and tombs of great saints. He would frequently spend time in these cemeteries, meditating or going on spiritual retreats called Khalwa. He continued to live an ascetic life and he took part in the literary circles of the region, uh, studying both religious and profane literature and would actually become quite an accomplished poet himself, as we will see later. He also took part in debates regarding theology or doctrinal theology, kalam, and also philosophy or falsafa. Uh, he would also be in contact with Christian thinkers and Jewish thinkers and probably the Kabbalah movement. But Ibn Arabi throughout most of his life is surprisingly uninterested in refuting or accepting any of the ideas of the theologians of the philosophers. He disagreed with much what the philosophers and theologians taught, but he also said that much of it contains truth as well. He simply wasn't that interested in knowledge conveyed through intellect as such, but rather knowledge through a mystical unveiling or intuition, known as kashf, and we'll talk about this much later, but this is important to remember that Ibn Arabi as a philosopher is primarily interested in knowledge through uh, experience, through tasting, and through intuition, rather than like a philosopher through rational or intellectual debate. But this doesn't deny the fact that Ibn Arabi in his writings and in the language he uses is still highly influenced and inspired by the philosophers. A good example of Ibn Arabi's very sometimes strange relationship to the philosophers is his very famous meeting with Ibn Rushd, known in the West as Averroes. Ibn Arabi tells this story himself, that Ibn Rushd had heard about Ibn Arabi uh, and his great spiritual powers or status, even though Ibn Arabi at this time was likely very young in his teens or very early adulthood, and of course the fact that Ibn, Ibn Rushd were friends with Ibn Arabi's father. But the story goes that Ibn Arabi arrives at Ibn Rushd's place after his invitation and they greet each other very warmly and respectfully, after which Ibn Rushd asks Ibn Arabi, 
quote, what kind of solution have you found through illumination and divine inspiration? Is it just the same as what we receive from speculative thought? To which Ibn Arabi replied, yes and no. Between the yes and the no, spirits take flight from their matter and necks break away from their bodies. You can do what you will with that quote. He continued to have visions and illuminating spiritual experiences as he traveled across North Africa and Spain. In the year 1194, at the age of 29 and in the city of Tunis, in modern Tunisia, Ibn Arabi entered what he calls God's wide earth, Arad Allah al wasiah sometimes also the realm of symbols, Manzil al rumuz or the earth of reality, Arad al haqiqa this can be seen as one of the highest stages of the spiritual path, as Ibn Arabi himself puts it, quote, It is only realized by those who inhabit God's vast earth, which contains both the contingent and the eternal. This is the earth of God. Whoever dwells there has realized true servitude with regard to God, and God joins that person to himself. And that this earth, this God's wide earth, is, quote, a supraformal intelligible earth, not a sensory earth. One of the foremost scholars of Ibn Arabi today, William Chiddick, explains the concept as such, quote, at the highest stage of self-knowledge, the Gnostics recognize their own nature as the infinite and never-ending self-disclosures of God. In their constant visions of the forms of self-disclosures, they live along with Ibn Arabi in God's wide earth. A lot of strange and very complicated words and concepts here, but this will be at least a little clearer once we talk about Ibn Arabi's actual teachings and ideas, but we'll get there soon, I'll leave this for now. He was also given another great vision in 1190 in the city of Cordoba, where he witnessed all the prophets and messengers of God assemble to name him the so-called seal of Mohammedan sainthood. Now we should stop here for a second and talk about the word Wali, which is what I and many others have here translated as saint. Now we should be careful not to draw too close parallels to the Christian idea of saint. This is very different. But in the Sufi tradition throughout history, there have been many men and women who have been called by the name Wali, which in Arabic literally means friend and thus denotes a person's close proximity or intimacy with God. So when Ibn Arabi talks about the Khatim al-Awliya, the seal of the saints, this is the concept that he's talking about. This could also then be translated as the seal of the Muhammadan friends. As many of you probably know, Muhammad is known to Muslims as the Khatim and nabiin the seal of the prophets, which to the majority of Muslims means that Muhammad is the last and final prophet of God. But when Ibn Arabi considers himself to be the seal of the saints, or specifically the seal of the Muhammadan saints, he isn't claiming that he is the last saint or last wali that would ever exist. Instead, he believes that every saint is the, quote, inheritor of a certain prophet. Some saints are, so to say, heirs to Jesus or Moses, and some are heirs to Muhammad. Ibn Arabi viewed himself as the last saintly complete heir to Muhammad himself, or in the Muhammadan line of saints, and thus inherit all the knowledges and sciences, so to say, of Muhammad. Quote, Ibn Arabi maintains that there are friends of God in every age and that they will continue to inherit from Muhammad, but they will no longer have access to the entirety of Muhammad's works, states, and sciences. The modalities of the inheritance will be defined by their connection to specific prophets embraced by Muhammad's all-comprehensive prophethood. Being the last inheritor of Muhammadan sainthood is a very privileged position to be given. Quote, if the Muhammadan friends of God inherit all the sciences of Muhammad, this means that they have been open to all the knowledge and understanding given to all the prophets, since Muhammad is seen as the all-comprehensive prophets who contain the messages of all the previous prophets. Thus, the seal of the Muhammadan friends will somehow embody the whole Quranic message. In other words, Ibn Arabi thought very highly of himself, and of course, even though he considered himself to have been given this position by the prophets themselves, this is a standpoint that has been criticized by many as being very, well, pretentious, uh, which is maybe understandable. But this is still a very important concept uh, to understand in order to, well, to understand Ibn Arabi and his worldview and his the view he had of himself and his responsibility towards the larger 
Muslim community and the world at large. And after spending the first half of his life in the environment of uh, Al-Andalus and the Maghrib, he then decided to leave his home region and travel to the eastern parts of the so-called Muslim world. And this is a trip that he would never return from. One of the goals of this journey was to go on the Hajj pilgrimage to Mecca, which is a duty for every Muslim to undertake at least once in their life. He began by traveling to Egypt, where he stayed in Cairo or Fustat, ruled at the time by the Ayyubid dynasty of the famous Saladin. He then took a detour through Jerusalem before finally reaching the Hejaz and the holy city of Mecca in the year 1202. His stay in Mecca, which he visited at least twice, and the stay lasted for three years, would be one of the most significant and important periods of Ibn Arabi's life. It would be the catalyst for some of his most important literary works. It was here that he met the young woman Nizam, whom he fell hopelessly in love with at first glance, and would inspire him to write the fantastic poetic work, the Tarjuman al-Ashwaq, the Interpreter of Desires, in which his love for Nizam serves as a metaphor for love of God. It was also in Mecca that he had another one of his most major spiritual visions. While ritually circulating the Kaaba and praying, he encountered what he calls a youth, who began communicating with him through metaphors. And after a short profound conversation, Ibn Arabi realized who this youth really was. He puts it like this in the introduction to the Futuhat al makiya Quote, Suddenly, while I was before the black stone, astonished, I came upon the transient youth, the silent speaker, the one who is neither living nor dead, the composite simple, the encompassed encompassing. He made a secret gesture and I knew. Then he shunned to me a truth of his beauty and I was overwhelmed with passion. I was felled before him and the moment overcame me. It seems that the youth is in some way God himself communicating with Ibn Arabi. But it's not entirely clear in what way. Ibn Arabi calls it the spirit. Um, and the youth seem to refer to God as something other than itself sometimes. But at other times it's much clearer with the youth referring to himself as the Lord. And so it becomes clear that in some way at least this seems to be God communicating with Ibn Arabi. Ibn Arabi then has an ecstatic experience or vision where he witnesses basically the entire universe or cosmos etched into the body of this youth. It's incredible imagery. Quote, the youth said, I am the mature garden, the universal harvest. So lift my veils and recite what is contained etched in my lines. What you learn from me, put it in your book and speak directly in it to everyone dearest to you. I lifted his veils and I observed his etched lines and there shone to my eyes his light that was deposited on him, whatever he contained and encompassed of hidden knowledge. What Ibn Arabi saw etched into the body of this spirit, this youth, is what would become his probably greatest work, the Futuhat al makiya which means the Meccan, the Meccan revelations or the Meccan openings, which is a massive piece of work that spans over 10,000 pages. For the next couple of years, Ibn Arabi would continue to travel around different regions and cities, but this time in the east instead of the west. He stayed in Konya in Turkey, Iraq, Egypt and Palestine among other places. He married and had children, and at the same time had the most productive period of his life. It is during this last period of his life that he composes the majority of his written works. He eventually decided to settle down in the city of Damascus around the year 1223 and would stay there for the rest of his life. And from here, he would continue to give spiritual guidance to his students and write great works of poetry and prose while at the same time raising his family. Ibn Arabi had many disciples who would later become famous in their own right. Um, his most closest or some would say maybe favorite disciple was a man by the name of Ibn Saudakin who had accompanied Ibn Arabi for basically the majority of his life. Another one of his most prominent students was Sadradin Qunawi, who had become his stepson after he married the young Sadradin's widowed mother. Qunawi would be considered his closest student in a way, and one whom he considered like a son. He would be the student that led the interpretation and dissemination of the Sheikh's work after his death, being responsible for much of our understanding of it today. Living mostly in Konya, Turkey, he also had close ties 
with the very famous contemporary Sufi poet Jalal ad-Din Rumi, which then indirectly connects two of the most famous Sufis in history, Rumi and Ibn Arabi, through his student Qunawi. There's a good example to show just how important and how close of a student Qunawi was to Ibn Arabi. Ibn Arabi would often hold audiences, or sama, where he would uh, present or read his new text to different people. And these, these sessions were attended by different people depending on the nature of the text. So a text that were aimed to a more larger, broader general audience would be attended by a lot of people, his students and maybe general audiences as well, while other more difficult or complex works would be attended only by a chosen few, those who were his closest and most involved students. Now in 1233 he held one of these sessions for his one of his last and maybe his crowning work, which is a book called the Fusus al-Hikam, The Ringstones of Wisdom. And very interestingly, at this session where he read this book, only Sadr din Qunawi was present. Other students or acquaintances also include controversial figures like Afifa din Tilimsani, who had ties to another controversial Sufi philosopher called Ibn Sabain, who we can and probably will dedicate a whole other video to. Nonetheless, after a long life of great activity, traveling across the Muslim lands, writing a bunch of works and teaching many students on the spiritual path, Ibn Arabi probably left this world on November 8th, 1240, having reached the age of 75. Now, the life of Ibn Arabi is, of course, a very interesting tale filled with fascinating stories. But what is perhaps most significant about him is, after all, what he said, what he taught, and what he wrote, and what his ideas were. He wrote many different works. He said that he wrote hundreds of different works of varying lengths and contents. The most, some of the most famous of which I've already mentioned, like the Futuhat al makiyah the Meccan revelations or Meccan openings, which is this massive work of 10,000 pages that basically goes th go through everything. Like it's an encyclopedia of his entire thought. There's the very famous poetic work, the Tarjuman al-Ashwaq, the Interpreter of Desires, in which was inspired by the beautiful Nizam in Mecca. Uh, he also wrote the Ruh al-Quds, or the Sufis of Andalusia, in English translation, in which he tells these stories about the great Sufis of the Western tradition in Andalus and uh, Maghrib. And lastly, the Fusus al-Hikam, which to some is his crowning work, and in which he presents his metaphysical ideas in full and sometimes shocking force. But what do these texts actually say? What are the ideas and teachings of Ibn Arabi that is both so controversial and so loved at the same time? This is what we will talk about in part two. Okay, so Ibn Arabi's metaphysics and cosmology is a very broad and complicated subject, but it's impossible for me to fit it into one video. But he is associated with a doctrinal idea that's referred to as Wadat al-Wujud, or the unity of being. It is this philosophy that his followers to this day see as the culmination and utmost expression of monotheism, while those who are skeptical of him see it as a complete heresy. Now what's important to remember is that Ibn Arabi himself never uses the word Wadat al-Wujud, the unity of being, but this is a name or a term that was used by later thinkers and was applied to him. But this isn't to say that the ideas that we mean when we say Wadat al-Wujud doesn't apply to Ibn Arabi, because in his writings he often of course seems to imply a lot of these ideas. Even so, Ibn Arabi is notoriously difficult of a writer who rarely speaks in clear terms. He isn't a philosopher in the traditional sense of that term, in that he doesn't present his arguments or his ideas as rational arguments or as a systematic presentation. Rather, it is structured as visions and illuminations, spiritual experiences, basically, that he retells. Therefore, when we interpret Ibn Abi, we are often relying on later interpreters, later writers, who have formulated his ideas into a more systematic form. Chief among these, of course, is Sadr al Qunawi, his closest student that I mentioned earlier. Qunawi is very much responsible for systematizing Ibn Arabi's ideas into a more coherent philosophical language. 
We aren't exactly sure what Ibn Arabi meant a lot of the time. My point is that it's important to remember that we are relying on outside commentators and it's always open to interpretation how these ideas should be understood. And I will be relying on outside interpretations, later commentators, in my presentation of the unity of being as such. In short terms, the doctrine of the unity of being is based on taking monotheism to its most extreme end. It not only states that God is the only divinity in existence, he is the only being in existence. One of God's so-called 99 names in the Quran is Al-Haq, which means the truth or the real or the reality. With this in mind, the Islamic proclamation, La ilaha illallah, isn't simply read as there is no God but God or there is no divinity but the divinity, but instead as there is no reality but the real or thus ultimately there is nothing but God. To Ibn Arabi and his followers, there is only one singular reality and that reality is God. Ibn Arabi identifies God in his utmost essence as wujud or being or existence. So God is being, he isn't a being, he is being itself. And since Islamic theology requires that God not only be the only divinity, but also that he is absolutely one, that must necessarily mean that being or existence itself is one, absolutely one. This also means that if anyone says that anything exists except of God, one is actually committing shirk or polytheism, which is the greatest sin in Islam, since you are saying that there is a being that isn't God. But being is God, and that basically means you're saying that there is another God. But if God is the only reality, what are we? What is creation? There appears to be multiplicity everywhere. What, what's that? Um, to Ibn Arabi, anything other than God, which is creation basically, is utterly non-existent. It's a kind of illusion. He writes, quote, The world is illusory. It has no real existence. This is what is meant by imagination, khayal. You have been made to imagine that the world is something separate and independently real, outside of the absolute. But in reality, this is not so. But it isn't an illusion in the ultimate sense. We do have a certain existence on the physical plane. It's not all a dream, like in Advaita Vedanta and Hinduism, for example. The illusion is the idea of separation, that I exist as a separate being, when in reality only God exists. The only true self is God's self, and ours are only relative reflections of this self. One of the most celebrated scholars from Ibn Arabi schools, Mahmud Shabistari, wrote a masterpiece of Persian poetry called the Gulshan i Raz, in which he explicates the doctrine of the unity of being. And he writes, quote, When absolute existence is alluded to, people use the word I as a matter of expression. When reality has taken form through individuation, you refer to it in language with the word I. You and I are accidents of the essence of being like openings and the covering of the lamp of being. Ibn Arabi himself loves to use metaphors to describe this relationship between God and the world. One of them is where he describes it almost like a light, a pure white light, which is God's being that travels through a prism and creates a multitude of colors, which would be the world. The colors themselves are never the same as the white light, just as the creatures or creation is never the same as God, but at the same time, they consist of nothing but the white light. He also describes the world as the shadow of God, being at once the same as him and exactly that which is not him. Quote, We say, no, that what one calls other than the real, and which is referred to as the world, is in relation to the real as a shadow is to an object. It is the shadow of God. It is in just this way that existence is attributed to the world. For without doubt the shadow is existent in the sensory domain, albeit only when there is something wherein the shadow is manifest. Ibn Arabi often operates within paradoxes. There is nothing but God, but we as creatures are also absolutely not God. We are he and not he. In Arabic, huwa la huwa. There's a metaphor to describe this idea that I really like personally, which comes from the author Robert Abdul Haidar in his introduction to the translation of Mahmud Shabistari. There he describes the God-world relationship through the symbol of a projector. Imagine a projector projecting a movie or image onto a wall. 
the light from the projector is being, or God's reality, God. The wall on which it projects is non-existence, it's non-being, nothingness. It is in the meeting of absolute being and nothingness that the created world operates as an isthmus, a line in between the two extremes. We, as in creation, are the images themselves, formed by the light which, despite taking different forms, remain one and undivided. It is the nothingness that obscures that light that create the forms, but the light itself remains unchanged. Fakhreddin Iraqi, another famous writer in the Ibn Arabi school, writes the following in his book Lama'at, quote, Come then into my eyes and look, and you will see a sun shining through a thousand bits of glass, beaming to plain sight through each array of color. Why should any difference appear between this one and that? All light is one, but colors a thousandfold. If you've read Hindu philosophy or Taoism or Christian mystics like Meister Eckhart, a lot of this will seem very familiar to you. In fact, the doctrine of the unity of being sometimes bears a striking resemblance to philosophies like Advaita Vedanta or certain ideas within Taoism, for example, among many other uh, things. There are differences, of course, but they share aspects explained thus far with a single absolute non-dual reality being identified with God and denying the reality of anything beside him. But what creates the forms of the world themselves? What is the world when it is not pure being? And where does multiplicity come from? It will help a bit to try to look at things like the people back then would have viewed the world. Partly thanks to Ibn Sina or Avicenna, philosophically one had at this time started to separate between existence or being, wujud, on the one hand, and essence or whatness, mahia, uh, on the other. When talking about a thing or an object in the world, like this table in front of me, we can ask two basic questions about it. We can ask, is it? And we can ask, what? is it? The first question, is it, is a question of existence or being? And the answer to that question would be yes or no. Um, the second question, what is it, gives a completely different answer. And this is the question of essence or whatness, in this case a table. Table is independent of whether or not it exists. It is a, an essence or a whatness that can either exist or not exist. It can either have existence or wujud being or it can have, it can not have existence or being. So according to Hodat al-Wujud, in terms of the existence or the being, the wujud of the objects of the world, they are God. Because remember, God is being. He is being itself. He's the only being. And so God is thus our being. He is our being. However, in terms of our essences, our whatness, we are absolutely not God. We are that which, by definition, God isn't. I, as a human being, Philip Holm, cannot possibly be God, because I am everything that God isn't. I am, I am finite, I am temporal, I am mortal, I have a certain form. These are all things that God cannot possibly be, because this would limit God, and God is limitless. God is eternal, God is perfect, God is immortal, and all these things. So this is the relationship that we have here. We are simultaneously God and not God. We are absolute existence and we are absolute non-existence. We are being and non-being all at the same time. But it doesn't end here. These essences or whatnesses also has a relationship with God, even if they aren't God directly. Here we will need to have some basic knowledge of Islamic theology again. So according to mainstream Islamic theology, God is absolutely transcendent beyond any creaturely qualities. So he doesn't have any attributes or qualities that any created things or creatures have. But according to the Quran and mainstream Islamic theology, he still has certain attributes. And each of his names, like Al-Haq or uh, Ar-Rahman or Ar-Rahim and so on, all these names that he's referred to by, corresponds to a certain attribute that he has. So Al-Haq means the truth or the real. He is the real. He is the truth. Ar-Rahman means the merciful. He is merciful. Ar-Rab means the Lord, for example. So all these names that he has is also an attribute that he has. Now, traditionally in the Quran, it is thought, said that God has 99 names and thus also 99 attributes. But according to Ibn Arabi, the names are actually infinite. He has an infinite amount of names and an infinite amount of attributes and qualities. And these attributes and qualities have a very important role to play in creation. 
Interestingly, there is an idea that Ibn Arabi expresses where God can be viewed in two different ways. There is firstly God as the essence, or avat, and this is the absolute ultimate reality and identity of God where there are no attributes and nothing at all can be said or understood or grasped about God. The extent of which we can say about him in this state is that he is, and beyond that language completely fails us. The attributes that we talk about are there in a sense Sense, but they are not attributes as such, but just parts of this unknowable essence in some mysterious way. Or not part of there, but they are this essence. The attributes are not distinguished. There's just this one essence that is completely unknowable. Then there is God as he relates to the world, the God with attributes like merciful or as creator and lord. And this is the form of God that most people think of when we talk about God. But this is not the ultimate form of God, the essence is. Uh, so the attributes in this sense are all dependent on creation. The attributes like merciful creator are only relationships to us as creatures and don't exist in the essence in that same way. Instead, they could be seen as to simply point to be, we should see them maybe as metaphors that point to certain realities within this one essence. And this idea is obviously very similar to the idea expressed by Adi Shankara and Advaita Vedanta about Nirguna Brahman on the one hand and Saguna Brahman on the other. This is almost identical to Ibn Arabi's idea in fact. There's a hadith Qudsi, a saying of the Prophet Muhammad where God is speaking through him, in which God says, I was a hidden treasure and I loved to be known, so I created the world so that I might be known. Ibn Arabi loves this hadith as he uses it frequently. It is the key to understanding creation and the purpose behind it. I was a hidden treasure refers to God's essence and the attributes that are hidden therein. I loved to be known. He wants, to, he wants this hidden treasure to be experienced. Now, of course, he knows his own attributes since he, well, he, he is he. Uh, but he still wants his essence and attributes to be experienced through someone who is not him. So I created the world so that I might be known. Therefore, the world is created as a way for God to experience himself through someone other than himself. There's a great section in the Fusus al-Hikam where he talks about this relationship as a person who is talking about himself. So if I refer to myself and say something like, I really love coffee which I usually don't, but it's, let's say I, I say this. In saying I really like coffee, there is a duality created there between the one who is speaking and the one I'm speaking of. I'm speaking about myself, even though it's essentially really the same person speaking about himself. So this is the kind of relationship the world has to God. It is different from God. There is a duality created between the, the Lord, the creator and creation, but ultimately creation is simply God that is experiencing himself. But since this hidden treasure is to be known through the world, that must mean that the world contain traces of these attributes and qualities of God, right? This is absolutely true. To Ibn Arabi, the world is nothing but, to use William Chittick's words, the loci of God's self-disclosure or God's self-manifestation. So everything in the world, every essence in philosophical terms, every particle of this world reflect and reveal God's qualities and attributes in an indirect sense, like in a mirror. This is based partly on a Quranic verse that Ibn Arabi loves to apply, which goes, Whichever way you turn, there is the face of God. Now remember, the things of the world, or creation itself, is not God. He is absolutely transcendent of them. But in a real sense, they reflect everything in the world. The entire cosmos reflects God's attributes, and thus they are God in a sense too. In any case, since God is infinite, and so are the possibilities of his attributes, there is no end to the constant self-manifestation of God in the world. At every moment, at every instant, the world is created anew, revealing a new self-disclosure. The world in that sense becomes the continuous unfolding of God's manifestation in limited form. It's the unfolding of possibilities inherent in actuality. The essences of the world, the things, are contained in God's knowledge beyond time and space as something he calls the ayan athabita, the immutable entities. These are non-existent in themselves, but function almost as archetypes that determine what is created in the actual cosmos. 
and these ayanathabita are themselves determined by God's attributes as they in their totality reflect him. So God has these attributes or qualities, and then he has a knowledge of his own attributes or qualities, which are infinite, so there's an infinite number of possibilities, an infinite number of ways that his attributes can be manifested, and all these ways, all these forms in which he can manifest himself are contained in his own knowledge beyond time, and after which, when he wants to create something, he simply gives those archetypes, those ayanathabita, he gives them being. And at each instant is a new creation. At each instant is a new reflection of God that's constantly unfolding before our eyes. So the world relates to God in two ways. On the one hand, there is only one reality, the reality of being and God's essence, who are identical. And this is the hidden and unfathomable aspect of God that we cannot experience or see or hear in any way or experience in any way except through God himself. Only God himself can experience himself in his own essence. On the other hand, the things in the world are reflections of God's attributes and qualities. They aren't God directly, but they reflect him like in a mirror and receive his being like a containers almost. This is the manifest and apparent aspect of God which we experience at every moment, even if we don't realize it. So let's return to that projector again. As I said, the light itself is being, existence, it's God himself, it's God's essence. The wall on which it is being projected is nothingness, on which being is being projected. Um, the images that we see on the wall, that is the world, that is creation and ourselves. But these images are created by the light traveling through pieces of film which delimit and shape this light into these certain images. This film are the ayan thabita, the immutable entities that are reflections of God's attributes. So we have a situation here where from one perspective there is only light and different nuances of that light. But on the other hand, there are images on the wall which are determined by this light being dimmed or shaped into certain forms, which makes them different from the light because what makes them what they are is by definition that which is not the light. But at the same time, these images are also determined by the attributes that are contained within the light itself. I know this is a whole lot to take in and you may have to watch this a few times if you this is all new to you, but believe it or not, that is actually the basic, uh, a very basic, simple explanation of the doctrine of Radat al-Wujud. It is, you could say, a non-dual philosophy where reality is ultimately oneness and nothing exists except for God. He is all of being and he is the one in whose being my being resides. But there are many other nuances to it that make it a lot more complicated, as I hope I have shown you. Uh, some scholars, Western scholars, especially in the past, have referred to Ibn Arabi as a pantheist or a panentheist. And of course, while this is understandable, it really isn't that accurate, at least from the traditional, or the traditional understanding of the word pantheism. Uh, Ibn Arabi does, in a way, affirm that the world is God, since there is nothing but God, but at the same time, he's very careful to point out that the world is, at the same time, absolutely not God, and that God completely transcends the world. In fact, the world is, as I've said, the very definition of what God isn't. In terms of itself, the world is absolute nothingness, non-being who has, quote, never smelt a whiff of existence. This point is finally expressed by the 19th century figure Amir Abdel Qadir al-Jazairi, famous for his defense against French colonialism, who was also a follower of Ibn Arabi and his school. He states, quote, I am two things according to two different relations. With respect to you, I am the eternal forever and ever. I am the necessary being who epiphanizes himself. With respect to me, I am pure non-being who has never breathed the perfume of existence, the adventitious being who remains non-existent in his adventitiousness. Ibn Arabi himself also talks about this paradoxical situation through the terms tansih and tashbih, or similarity and difference. As I mentioned, the cosmos is huwa la huwa, it's he and not he. God is simultaneously the same and utterly different in every way. 
in the Fusus al-Hikam, he talks about this situation, how one needs to see the world through both eyes, of reason and intuition. Reason tells us that God is transcendent, while intuition or illumination lets us know that he is infinitely imminent at the same time. Quote, if you profess transcendence, tansich, you delimit. If you profess imminence, tashbih, you restrict. But if you profess both, you have been shown the right way. You are a leader in the Gnostic sciences, a master. In other words, if you look at, say, a rock and say, this is not God, he is beyond compare, you are qualifying God and thus, in a way, limiting him. But if you say this rock is God, you are also limiting him to this rock in particular, which is equally false. Instead, he urges us to see it as both at the same time. God is always present and he is always not present. Wherever we look, it is always God, but also never really God. Quote, Do not look to the real while divesting him of creation, and do not look to creation clothing it with aught but the real. Make him incomparable and make him similar, and reside in the seat of sincerity. Be thou in union if you wish, or if you wish in distinction. Through both obtain a great success. This leads us to another concept, which is sometimes referred to as the divinity of beliefs. As I mentioned earlier, Ibn Arabi wasn't just a prose writer who wrote complicated metaphysical works, he was also a very accomplished poet. And one of his most famous poems, probably the most famous, that's always quoted when, when people talk about Ibn Arabi, is a poem from the collection the Tarjuman al-Ashwaq, the Interpreter of Desires, that I mentioned uh, earlier. This poem has been recited numerous times because of its incredible beauty, and it goes like this. O oh marvel, a garden amidst the flames. My heart has become capable of every form. It is a pasture for gazelles and a covenant for Christian monks, and a temple for idols and the pilgrim's Kaaba, and the tables of the Torah and the books of the Quran. I follow the religion of love. Wherever way love's camels take, that is my religion and my faith. This may appear like an expression of religious tolerance or pluralism, which it really isn't, in fact. Uh, instead, it's a natural extension of Ibn Arabi's metaphysics. Since the world is God's manifestation and the place of his so-called self-disclosure, that must mean that whatever we worship, we are worshipping God, right? Quote, Do not attach yourself to any particular creed exclusively, so that you disbelieve all the rest. Otherwise, you will lose much good. Nay, you will fail to recognize the real truth of the matter. Let your soul be capable of embracing all forms of belief. God, the omnipresent and omnipotent, is not limited to any one creed. Is he saying that all beliefs and therefore all religions are equally valid? In short terms, no, he isn't. He is saying that whatever it is you believe about God, it is right in a sense. Because God is all there is, and everything in the world is a reflection and manifestation of God. Whatever you worship, be it Jesus on the cross, an idol or a rock, it is ultimately all God. So you are right in your worship in that sense. However, Ibn Arabi is of course a Muslim, and a very staunch one. He believes that Islam is the one true religion, end of discussion. Where the people worshipping Jesus or a rock go wrong is that they are limiting God to that specific form. Yes, God is the rock, and yes, God is Jesus in the statue, but only in the sense that they are manifestations of him. God is much bigger and more transcendent than that. To Ibn Arabi, everyone is actually just worshipping themselves and forms their perception of God according to their own natures. Quote, One only believes in a divinity through what he has made within his own soul. In other words, one experiences the divine according to one's own nature or one's own soul. We create an image of God in our own heads and then we worship that image, that image that we have of God. And while in one sense we are correct in that worship, uh, what we are really doing is only worshipping ourselves and our own mental creations. This critique also extends to his fellow Muslims, as he sees many of them, or maybe most of them, as being idolaters. Um, sure, they don't worship a rock or an actual idol made of stone, but they still create this image of what God is in their head and then they worship that God, and this to him is also a form of idolatry. In this discussion he uses a saying by an older Sufi thinker by the name Junaid, who said that the water takes on the color of the cup. 
And this is true of people's experience or, or perception of God. God uh, manifests or discloses himself to people according to their own receptivity or their own preparedness. So everyone experiences God differently according to, as I said, their nature. But the person who recognizes that all these images are God, but that he simultaneously transcends all of them, that person is truly illuminated. He will be able to see every image as God, that every moment, whatever way we turn, there is the infinite self-disclosure of God. Thus the famous poem now makes a lot more sense. It's speaking from the point of view of a master Gnostic who has reached the furthest station on the spiritual path, what Ibn Arabi calls the station of no station. Here one's soul or heart is in constant flux, realizing that it is only the eternal reflection of God which is infinite. This soul or heart can take on any form. It can see God in every form, whether it be the pasture for the gazelles, the cloister for the monks, or the pages of the Quran. One is not bound to witnessing God in any one of these forms. Instead, one follows the religion of love, the innermost cause of creation, and in which everything expresses God's love of creation and vice versa, creation's love for God. So as I mentioned earlier, the entire cosmos is a manifestation, a reflection of the entirety of God's names, or the entirety of God's attributes. While a certain object in the world, or a certain thing, only reflects one or, or a certain combination of certain attributes or names, the entire cosmos reflects all of the names. So the creation as a whole is a direct reflection of, of God's entire nature, his, all of his attributes. The cosmos is thus often referred to by Ibn Arabi as the ma macrocosm, or the great man, insan al-kabir. But the human being also has a central role to play in this scheme, and he is often referred to as the microcosm, or the small man, insan al-sagir. The human being thus also reflects all the names and all the attributes, but in a contained form. So the, the, the human being is a microcosmic reflection of the macrocosm that is the entire universe. And so everything that exists on the inside exists on the outside, as above, so below, and, and, and so on. Thus, the human being has a very central role to play in creation. You could say that he is even the purpose of creation itself, as he, he is the only place except for the, in, the cosmos in its entirety where all of the names and attributes are reflected, so it reflects all of God's attributes, and thus he completes the hidden treasures wanting to be known from the famous hadith that I quoted earlier. In fact, the very first lines of the Fusus al-Hikam is the following, Quote, the real will, the glorified be he, in virtue of his beautiful names, which are innumerable, to see their identities, if you so wish you can say, to see his identity, in a comprehensive being that comprises the whole affair, insofar as it is possessed of existence, and his mystery is manifest to himself through it. This talks about the, obviously, creation of the human being and states that it is the culmination of God's wanting to know himself through the form of another. Man, in his most perfect and primordial form, is known as insan al-kamil, or the perfect or universal man. This term and concept is one of the most central aspects of Ibn Arabi's thought, arguably maybe the most central. Insan al-Kamil is a designation of God's perfect manifestation in human form, a human being who has reached a state of complete self-annihilation, where he recognizes himself as nothing but God's reflection and acts accordingly. In the perfect man, God is finally able to witness and glorify himself like in a mirror. One of the more famous writers and poets from the school of Ibn Arabi is a man by the name of Fakhr al-Din Iraqi, who wrote an incredible piece of, it was a combination of prose and poetry, called Lama'at, which means divine flashes. And in this book, he presents this relationship between God and the world through a triad of love, lover, and beloved, which is a rather common theme within Sufi poetry. Now, love can be seen as the utmost essence of God, being itself. 
and lover and beloved are the relationship between the human being and God as he is experienced by the human being. Man is the lover who longs for his beloved, which is God, and they gaze upon each other like in, in a mirror, in mirrors. So in a sense, God sees his own reflection in the mirror of the human being, and the human being sees his own reflection in the mirror of God. And these two, these lovers, want desperately to be close to each other. They want to unite with each other. And so the human being cleans this mirror of his heart so that it more and more can reflect more perfectly God's own reflection. And when this process is finally finished and reaches its culmination, the two are finally united and they reflect each other perfectly. And in this meeting, they realize that the difference between lover and beloved was only really an illusion. And the only thing that ever existed was the reality of love itself, which is identical with God's essence, avat, or being itself as such. Then the eye of certainty opens, and staring inwardly at himself, he finds himself lost, vanished. But he finds the friend, and when he looks still deeper, realizes the friend is himself. He exclaims, Beloved, I sought you here and there, asked for news of you from all I met. Then I saw you through myself, and found we were identical. Now I blush to think I ever searched for signs of you. The term insan al-kamil could also be used to refer to the cosmos at large in a way, and it functions in a similar way, but the human being, as you can see, has a very special position in Ibn Arabi's cosmology. And this description by Iraqi is the actual practice, or the, you know, the practical psychological aspects of Sufism, or Ibn Arabi's thought as well. Ibn Arabi was, of course, a Sufi, and so he would practice the most common Sufi practices like dhikr, remembrance, where the names of God or certain, you could say, mantras, almost certain t terms are repeated over and over again. And similar to many other Sufis, the goal of these, all these Sufi practices, or the goal of life in general, is to fight against your nafs, your ego, or your lower self, and r finally reach a, a unity, or to unite with God. But to Ibn Arabi and many other Sufis, there is never any uniting with God. This would actually be an impossibility, since that would mean that there was an imperfection in God if something can be added to him. Non-existence can never unite with absolute being. This is just an impossibility. Instead, Ibn Arabi puts a lot of emphasis on self-knowledge, since the, the human being and the self is a direct reflection of God as everything else is, the key to, so to say, enlightenment is actually to know yourself, to, to gain knowledge of your own self. There's a hadith where the Prophet Muhammad is thought to have said, know yourself and you shall know your Lord. Thus, the goal is to realize that one's own separate existence is a kind of illusion, as we are only the continuous self-manifestations of God. Thus, to know ourselves and to know our soul in a proper way is to know God, but this can only be achieved through the right kind of knowledge. So there is no uniting with God. The part of us that is creature, the part of us that is separate from him, can never unite with him. The goal is to realize that there is nothing but God and that our being is his being. Put in another way, uniting with God is not a process. It's a realization of what has always been. We don't unite with God. We realize that we, in a sense, were God all along. That which has united with God is not his creature. Such words are not spoken by the completed person. What is non-being that it should unite with the real, and a non-being makes spiritual journey and progression. In union the fantasy of you ends. Only when the other vanishes is their union. Don't say the contingent has transcended its limits. It has not become the necessary nor the necessary it. Union with the real is separation from createdness. Estrangement from oneself is acquaintance with the real. When the contingent removes the dust of contingency, except for the necessary, nothing remains. There are other aspects of the Insan al-Kamil and these other ideas that gives me headaches just thinking about it, so I will not go any further into it, but just know that this is a vast field. You can write phone books just about uh, these philosophies. Uh, but this has, believe it or not, been a very short introduction 
to Ibn Arabi's general metaphysical ideas. There's a lot more to it, as I said, but I could maybe explore that further in future videos, but this will be sufficient for now. While Ibn Arabi is a very original thinker, obviously, these ideas didn't appear just in a vacuum. He is very much dependent and influenced by other thinkers that had come before him. In his language, he is inspired by the Muslim philosophers like Ibn Sina, even if he is critical of them at times. Thus, we find a lot of traces of Neoplatonism in his thoughts, for example. Uh, when talking in philosophical language, like in the work Ittihad al kawni he talks about the hierarchy of existence in terms of first intellect, universal soul, and so on, which are very common Neoplatonic terms. In fact, some of his contemporaries thought that he was so influenced by this school that he had become known by some as Ibn Flatun, or the son of Plato. And even though he didn't consider himself a philosopher, and he was often very critical of their rational approach to theology, he still respected many of them a lot. In fact, in the Futuhat al makiya he refers to Plato as uh, Flatun Ilahi, or the divine Plato. We can also see traces from more unlikely places, like the Ikhwan as Safa, the Brethren of Purity, who were Ismailis. Some of the more esoteric aspects of his theoretical mysticism do have direct parallels in that movement, like the microcosm-macrocosm relationship, or small man versus large man, and they're sort of reflecting each other and so on. Since he was a Sufi and belonged to the Sufi tradition, he of course takes a lot of influence from previous Sufi thinkers and from general ideas that had been floating around in that movement as well. Uh, while he is often credited with the doctrine of the unity of being, it is clear that these ideas, or similar ideas, had been floating around for a long time among the Sufis. Uh, a very good example is the famous uh, Sufi from Baghdad, uh, Mansur al-Halaj, who is thought to have entered ecstasy and exclaimed, Anna al-Haq, I am the truth, or I am the real. He was saying, I am God, and was possibly executed for it, or at least very much uh, shunned. Uh, and there are many other examples. Rumi also expresses similar ideas, and Rumi was a near contemporary of Ibn Arabi, even if they never met. Uh, and so even if he was very important for this kind of philosophy, it is clear that other Sufis, both before and at the same time as him, had similar ideas, or the same ideas. What Ibn Arabi can be uh, said to have done is to, for the first time, theoretically, and in a, at least somewhat systematic way, formulate a, a theory, and also to add terms like insan al-kamil and other certain theoretical concepts to it. And of course, the creation of a certain school of followers that came after him, who would hold on to this idea or his expression of this idea very strongly in particular. Some people, scholars included, have presented Ibn Abi as being tolerant or uh, pluralistic. And this statement is problematic, partly because it's taken very modern terms and applying it to someone who lived almost a thousand years ago. But at the same time, he, in a lot of cases, expresses ideas that can't really be considered very tolerant. He was, as I said, a very staunch Sunni Muslim, and he wasn't that fond of Shiites, for example. He was also sometimes highly critical of the philosophers. Ibn Arabi had very strong opinions about things, and he was absolutely sure that he was right. Ibn Arabi's method of reaching knowledge was not primarily through reason or intellect, as the philosophers often would. Instead, he reaches knowledge by what he refers to as kashf, which means unveiling, which is a kind of intuitive spiritual knowledge that is directly experienced. Ibn Arabi believed that this form of knowledge was the highest in form, but that it should nonetheless be complemented with reason and revelation, revelatory texts like the Quran. As I've mentioned, he asks us to view the world with both eyes, of both reason and intuition. But despite this, he believed that the rational approach to God that the philosophers were taking was foolish and would only lead to confusion. They were misguided, he would claim, even if some of their ideas are true. And this is where some of that apparent tolerance actually does come in. He never denies that the philosophers has good things or true things to say. He affirms that they actually do and applies much of their terminology and thinking into his own writings. This includes the schools of theology like the Asharites and the Mu'tazila. Ibn Arabi believes that they all actually have good things to say and that at the, sometimes one is closer to the truth than another, but that he himself never subscribes to any one school of thought in particular. 
It is when it comes to the ultimate knowledge, the knowledge of God, not of things in this world. This is where reason becomes unnecessary or actually harmful. Here, when it comes to this level, the only way to reach true knowledge or proper knowledge is through kashf, it's through unveiling. So Ibn Arabi does have a somewhat lenient attitude towards the philosophers, even though he often disagrees with them. He holds a strong conviction that one should not engage in fighting about these matters. A good example is a letter he wrote to the theologian Fakhreddin Razi, in which he asks him to abandon his the rational theology and enter the mystical path instead. In this letter, he criticizes the philosophical approach that Al-Razi takes, but does so in a very friendly and sort of almost brotherly manner. Similarly, another good example of his approach would be the following, which is from one of his writings. Quote, It is best to separate yourself from people who do not believe in what you believe, who do not do what you do, and who are against your faith. Yet at the same time, you should not think badly of them or condemn them for what they are. Your intention in ignoring them should be that you prefer the company of believers. This idea of Ibn Arabi's so-called tolerance can also be extended to his general ethical ideas as well. He often claims that God's mercy precedes his wrath, and that mercy is the very foundation of existence, of creation. As such, he himself, as the heir to Mohammedan sainthood, is also responsible for spreading or extending that mercy in the world. He even called himself the unlimited mercifier. The author Claude Adas writes, quote, He wished to be a source of hope for all created beings. And Ibn Arabi himself writes, quote, Thanks be to God, I am not one of those who love vengeance and punishment. On the contrary, God has created me as a mercy, and has made me an heir to the mercy of him whom it was said, We have sent you only as a mercy towards the worlds. While he was a staunch Sunni Muslim with very strong convictions, and calling him tolerant is very anachronistic and problematic, one could argue that he certainly seems to have had a very compassionate and relatively open approach to existence and to religion. In many ways, he embodies the common Sufi ideal that love for God equals love of his creation. And this becomes even more prominent in his thoughts since essentially everything is God, and so obviously you must always want well for something that you love, if you love God. Help and serve as much as you can the people who hide their misery, who are content with their poverty, the travelers on the path to truth. Do not attribute to yourself virtue, goodness, and graciousness because of your service to the creation. Consider that you owe other people thanks for having humbly accepted your help. It is incumbent upon you to lighten the load of those who are burdened. If people whose pain you have helped to alleviate cause you pain in return, if their responses, their ways, their habits are dark and cast shadows upon you, show patience and forbearance. Quote, Above all, what you need is high morals, good character, proper behavior. You must identify your bad features and rid yourself of them. Your relationship to whomever you come into contact with must be based on the best of conduct. But what this means may vary with conditions and circumstances. Similarly, in the Fusus al Hikam, he shows similar tendencies of compassion and mercy. Quote, know that kindness for God's slaves deserves more care than does one zeal for God. Or, do you not see that God has made the poll tax and peaceful coexistence our obligation regarding the enemies of the religion, saying, quote, and if they incline to peace, do thou incline to it and put thy trust in God. To Ibn Arabi, to care for or guard God's creatures or other human beings is to care for or love God himself. So as you can see, there is certainly an argument to be made that the ethical teachings of Ibn Arabi could be considered by, using modern terms, tolerant, since one of his most important teachings is that we should extend unlimited love to all of God's creatures. On the other hand, which may surprise some of you, Ibn Arabi is almost fanatically strict when it comes to following the Sharia or the Islamic law. He's very adamant that his students and society in general follow the Sharia as it is laid down by God. Um, the Sharia or Islamic law should here primarily be seen as the the primary rituals of Islam, like like pray, daily prayers and fasting and, and uh, the pilgrimage and so on, but it also of course includes the more legalistically oriented aspects included in fiqh or jurisprudence. But here, in terms of fiqh, however, he is actually a bit more lenient in certain regards. Ibn Arabi was highly critical of the fuqaha or jurists of his day, 
who he felt had turned the religion into simply a system of rules, and thus neglected its actual inner reality, its inner meaning. To him, differences of opinion regarding legal matters are a mercy from God. Quote, God has made the divergence in legal questions a mercy for his servants and a broadening of what he has prescribed they should do to testify their adoration. But in the case of those who follow the jurists of our time, these jurists have prohibited and restricted what the sacred law had broadened in their favor. They say to the person who belongs to their school, if for example he is a Hanafi, don't go looking for a Ruksha from a Shafi regarding this problem you are faced with, and so on with all of them. This is one of the greatest calamities and heaviest constraints in the matter of religion. God himself has said, in religion he has not imposed anything difficult on you. The law has affirmed the validity of the status of anyone who makes a personal effort at interpretation for himself and for those who follow him. But in our day, the jurists have condemned this effort, claiming it encourages people to make a mockery of religion. For them to say this is the height of ignorance. Again, this should not be understood as some kind of liberal standpoint when the rule of the law is undermined. Ibn Arabi is in fact usually strict that it is observed, but it is a rather unique and more open perspective on the larger aspects of jurisprudence based on his understanding of, of mercy as an important aspect of creation and its role in religion generally. Another interesting point is his legal opinion that women can actually lead men and, and mixed congregations in prayer in the mosque, which is uh, very unusual, especially today, but not as unusual as you may think historically. And Ibn Arabi rep represents one of those people who considered women to be perfectly capable of leading men in prayer. Nonetheless, Ibn Arabi, both during his life and especially after, became a very significant and important figure in Sufism and Islam in general. His ideas like the Insan al-Kamil and Wadat al-Wujud would extend a huge influence on the later traditions. His ideas through Sadruddin Qunawi and his students became especially popular in the Persian world and later also in India, where its meeting with certain Vedanta traditions created some very interesting interreligious dialogue and discussions, as you may imagine. And even if it isn't as apparent, this, these doctrines are also very much present in the Arabic-speaking world as well. It's no wonder that he is called the greatest master. In most Sufi contexts, you will find traces of his doctrines. In India, many of the famous sages and princes like Akbar and Darashiko were influenced by the unity of being. It most likely influenced Hinduism and Vedanta through their meeting and different forms of synthesis as well. Through different Muslim saints, it also made its way into things like Sikhism, which appeared in the 15th and 16th centuries. While we shouldn't attribute too much of this to Ibn Arabi himself, the ideas of a oneness of reality was expressed in Sufism and in the Islamic world before his time as well, but we should recognize that he's a monumental figure in the history of mysticism, philosophy, and human thought in general. He's an incredibly difficult thinker, but one that is infinitely fascinating nonetheless. I'll see you next time.